Greetings, everyone. I bring you greetings from the beautiful city of New Orleans, Louisiana, from Audubon Park, right here by these lovely, wonderful trees. Trees that grow, their roots are deep. And I love these trees here because they have so much character. They literally come down to the ground and get on the level with you. So that's a branch that I'm sitting by. And I'm going to make today's video. And today's video is going to be about death. I want to talk about, I want to talk to you today about death in the wake of the um, latest American tragedy of losing Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gigi and seven other people um, in the helicopter crash on this past Sunday, I wanted to make a video. Um, let's just talk about death. Let's talk about death. So if you, uh, I am Yariel, and if you've kept up with my page, then you also know that I was a childhood preacher. So I was born and raised and taught the way of the Bible. And now that I'm older, I'm at a place now where I tried and I lived a lot of that and I've come to find a different way that spirit is leading me down. He called me out of the church back in April, April 19th of 2015 to be exact. And I have videos about that. You can go and watch those. But my whole um, thought process about death has changed. So, um, I want to talk about that today and just as a sidebar this is my first video showing my hair I've had my hair covered for almost two months now I have started my locks all the way over so these are this is how locks start today was the first day um, I had a real loctician that actually twisted me up and fixed me up so I started off with little plaits as you can see because my hair has a wavy curly texture and it's soft and so it's when you're growing dreadlocks it's easier to grow them if your um, hair is coarse that makes for the best hair for dreadlocks but anyway it's gonna happen it's gonna take a minute but this is my first time so I'm out the closet with my hair okay so back to what I want to talk about let's talk about death the thing that I love about this whole situation with Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gigi is that there is an abundance of video footage of him with his daughter. I don't think that's by chance. I don't think that's by happenstance. Um, I think he legitimately had a great relationship with his daughter. And it seems like their closeness might have even been on the level of that soulmate type of level. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Now, again... My beliefs are not uh, biblically substantial, but it's just what I feel like I've come to know uh, by the spirit, in the spirit, mixed in with different um, audio books I've read or listened to by different um, mediums and psychics and spiritual teachers and people. So that's, you know, that's where my belief system is now. It's just a little mix of everything that feels good and feels right. And I'm sure the average person that's a hardcore Bible thumper, Bible believer, probably feels I'm operating under a spirit of deception um, and all that good stuff. So this video ain't for you. Turn it off and move on to the people who really want some comfort and want to talk about death. Um, I don't take death hard like I used to. I cry. I may even be sad and all of that like the next person, but... I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I heard, I heard a Christian say that they lost sleep because Kobe and his daughter died. They were just so nerved up they couldn't take it. They couldn't even sleep. And I said, that ain't right. Now, let's pick up the Bible. The Bible says that when thou liest down to sleep, thy sleep shall be sweet. The Bible also says to be uh, absent from the body is to be present with God or present with the spirit or in a safe place in a happy place and so oftentimes I think most of us are afraid of the whole death situation because 
it's a subconscious fear. It's a fear that we dare not um, articulate or verbalize or vocalize because of the fact that you are taught these Bible beliefs about the whole heaven and hell thing. And then we begin to judge people based on whether or not we, where we think they went. So if they didn't live the way that we thought they should live, maybe like go to a particular church, sit up under your style of bishop who's filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues and things of that nature. And I'm talking to, my message is for people who are, who are coming away from the church or who've been away from that level of religion. It's specific, but I mean, anybody can get something out of it. But I think that there is a subconscious foreboding over us about simple things like death. So a lot of times when the person dies, somewhere deep in our hearts, we're wondering if they made it in or not. And if you didn't make it in, then that's not a good thing. And that, boys and girls, I think is the biggest problem out of everything. The second thing when it comes to death, I think people flat out are just selfish a lot of times, especially when it comes to these elderly loved ones who are 99 years old and have dementia and their little bodies have given up on them, their minds then turn around and walked out and we still holding prayer visuals, holding them here in these bodies that can't take their life anymore. We hold them here out of selfishness by praying for them and we keep them here because we want them here. It's comforting for us to have big mama and auntie and whoever else, God mama, we want them here. But a lot of times it's time for that person to go. We have to realize that we come to this earth and I believe, this is my latest belief system. It may sound like a bunch of hogwash, but this is what I believe. And it, and it definitely goes for this situation with Kobe and his daughter. And it goes for, I don't know how many of you remember that um, duck boat incident where a lady went on, it was in, uh, I think it was Brazelton, uh, uh, Brazelton, Missouri. It's a tourist spot where they do a lot of Opryland and a lot of uh, country shows and stuff like that. Um, they had a duck boat tour. A duck boat is when you're on tour sightseeing and then the boat leaves the land and it turns into a boat. It's a bus rather. It leaves land and it turns into a boat and then you go into the water and you float out, float out. On this particular day, there was like a, some kind of weather forecast that said all the boats need to come off the water. But this particular boat decided he was going to do one last trip out and then he would come off the water. Well, unfortunately, the duck boat capsized. And when it did so, um, many lives were lost. And I believe there was this one lady on there, black lady had, I want to say nine older relatives. They were like over 50, over 60 years old on the tour, plus her husband and like a baby. And at the end of the day, I'm going to say that lady ended up going on that trip and surviving. She survived and like a nephew survived. He was probably maybe like 12 years old. And I think a baby, maybe. And then everybody else in her family that was with her died. So she ends up having to have a funeral for like nine people. That kind of tragedy is mind boggling. It's overwhelming. How do you process that? Where do you put it? How do you deal with something like that? And from that point on, I started leaning towards, and I actually have a movie script that I'm writing um, that actually has Tamar Braxton in mind as, as the lead character for it. But it's a movie script that I have called Next Life, Please. And it is um, built around this whole concept. I believe that before we come to earth, and if you think, let's use the Bible. If we want to use the Bible, let's use the Bible. You think there's a scripture in the, body, in the Bible where Christ speaks to God and he says, prepare me a body that I might go. And then he came in through, through the body, through Mary and Joseph as the Christ child, as we knew him, born in Bethlehem. 
Okay. So with that mindset, I believe that we already exist in soul form. I believe that all of us here on earth are souls having a bodily experience. We are already spirit. We are spirit. This, this body, this frame is not who I am. There's a spirit inside of me that has lived other lives and other generations on. And I believe that my ancestors lived through me. So after, after they die, they're reborn in other generations to come by your DNA. That's just my belief system now. So with that being said, if a group of family members died, nine of them died together. It's my belief system right now that they came here together and they left together. They came here on a path and they left together. But to us, it looks like a tragedy because one person just lost her husband and her kids. And oh my God, how do you, it's bad enough when you grieve in one person, you got to grieve four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's a lot of people. But if we can just leave our worldly understanding and really get into a spiritual place and think there has to be more to this than that because it's so mind boggling. I believe that people get together and they form a plan or you sit down with an oracle or higher ups, whatever the chain of command is in heaven. I don't know what it is because we don't all know, you know, you have to go over there to see. But I believe you sit down with a team and you decide what lineage you're going to come through. So you come through a certain lineage. A lot of us black folks coming through single parent mothers. Some of us come through a mother that's going to die early when we're 10 or 12. And we have to live this life to grow up without a mother. And if we do it right, we will reach a certain place of success or success is subjective. So it may be a certain place of um, accomplishment. What will I learn in this life? What am I on this earth to do? And those are the kind of questions you have to get to a point where you can answer them. And then it's a little bit more easier to stomach um, a lot of the turmoil and the distress that we experience here on earth. I know this sounds real spacey for some folks, but the people that are with me, you've, you've been along. He that hath the ear, let him hear. I'm going to move on to the next part. Um, I believe with Kobe Bryant in particular and his daughter, and it is pretty fresh and pretty early for me to be speaking on this. However, with all due respect, I want to speak my insight or my opinion on it from the uh, view of an elder. Um, I love what I see when I see that he had this bonded relationship with his daughter. A lot of times when people come to earth like that and they're bonded like that, like you could have a twin brother, but you're closer to your first cousin than your twin brother, stuff like that. I believe that those are soul packs. Yes. Like you make a pack with somebody and you come to earth. That thing where you meet somebody and it's like you've known them for your entire life. Y'all meet at the, at the beauty shop or in the frozen food section of Walmart and you start talking and you're friends for life or you meet up in college and you never let go. You maybe, maybe you meet freshman year in college and then you go off to different college, you go off to another college and, and you don't finish school together, but you end up knowing each other for life. Um, or you be a support system for life or that friend who you were friends with and you met them and maybe y'all were close, but you don't talk every day. But just when you need them, just when you need them, that phone rings. And this friend who you only talk to every three years, maybe. Not, not, not that you count, but you talk to them every blue moon. But when they call, it's right on time. You all are able to catch up with each other. You are on the same page spiritually. You're growing. You're learning some of the same stuff. I believe that kind of stuff is soul made -ish, soul packed -ish, ordained, destined, destined mates, whatever you, whatever play on words you want to use with it. I believe that is, that is that. And no, you're not going to find any of this in the Bible, but this is honestly what I believe now. And it helps me. It comforts me. It helps me in my grieving process. And, um, I just love the thought pattern. It kind of eases the blow. 
So when I look at Kobe and his daughter, Gigi, I'm, it's getting cold like him. Hold up, y'all. I got to get on my scarf. Ooh. Kind of chilly. I should have put my sweater on. But when I look at him and his daughter, Gigi, and I see so much closeness, I see so many photo ops, so many video ops of them together. S secret father-daughter handshakes that they're doing. You know, after he wins a game, they got celebratory things that they're doing. And you see this girl at her age hooping like she was doing. It's like you're living, you've lived a life. He's accomplished what it takes most people a lifetime to accomplish. Went straight into the NBA without college. Just doing things that other people didn't do. Leaving a mark. All that kind of stuff shows that you came here for a purpose and you fulfilled it. So it's not surprising that you've transitioned over now as of Sunday. It looks tragic because we had to have some kind of way for you to get out of here. We live life. So if you're living, you have to die in order to be dead. So in order to get out of this body, you have to die. And so unfortunately, when you die, something has to happen. The heart has to stop beating. There's an accident. Um, or maybe somebody kills you or whatever. So his was an accident. It was an accident. And I know this may sound cold and callous. And oh, I'm not saying this from a point of view of don't grieve, don't be sad, be over it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is don't be so fixated on the anxiety that comes along with death. There's an anxiety that can come along with death to where people be afraid, afraid to get in airplanes and helicopters now. Every airplane and helicopter ain't finna be falling out the sky. So you have to make sure that you don't fall into a place of anxiety and know that God's will has been done. This is the way that it was meant to be. This was a timing for them. I don't believe God makes mistakes. As sad as it is, as heartbreaking as it is, as big of a challenge and a new normal as it'll be for the families and the loved ones that are left behind, I still believe all things are working together for the good. And I do also believe that his death is going to be very monumental. It's, it's life changing. I can feel the shift already. You can feel a change in the atmosphere, his death has affected people. I wasn't a basketball watcher. I knew of his name because he was a household name. You know, he was that well known. I don't watch basketball. I don't, you know, I knew he played for the Lakers and somewhere in there, I knew there was a scandal about, you know, there was a scandal at one point and all of that. I think he traded teams or whatever. I didn't even know he was retired. Shows you how much I keep up with it, but I knew the name. And I was standing, I was at Michael's. Actually, I was, I was, uh, well, this ain't the one that I got. I was getting a necklace for my crystal. Uh, these things break from time to time. So I was getting a new little necklace at uh, Michael's. I was standing in line and the lady behind me gasped. And she said to me, I said, what's wrong? She said, well, my daughter just texted me and told me that Kobe Bryant um, died in a helicopter accident. And I had the necklace. It was in like a little plastic wrapper, a little cardboard thing. And I just started hitting the lady with it like, no, no, get up out of here. And so me and her were having a moment in the line, total stranger. We were having a whole moment at the shock of it all. And she was like, I'm trying to see if this is real. I'm trying to see if it's a hoax. And I was devastated. I was like, wait a minute. It hit me really hard. And it hit me hard on the level of the way 9-11 hit me. I was living in Detroit, Michigan. As a matter of fact, I was on my way. I was working for the headquarters office for Domino's Pizza. On a, they call it, if you're from uh, Detroit, they call it the farm. I worked on the Domino's Pizza farm. It's actually a petting zoo. It's a farm. And there's live buffalo that roam out there on the farm at the Domino's Pizza World Headquarters. But we were having a big meeting with, at the time, Dave Brandon was president. And we were just, you know, getting on the elevator. Everybody was getting on the elevator. And we went down to the meeting. And as we were setting up, they told us to go back to our desk because an American tragedy had taken place and that somebody had hit the world, uh, planes had hit the World Trade Center. And that to go back, get by our desk, get by our computers and our radios, 
to hear an update on what was going on. Well, I was dumb. I didn't even know what the World Trade Center was. I was like, what's the World Trade Center? I don't, I don't even know what that is. So we all went back to our desk, and I remember that day, which is a whole other story. I'm going to tell the rest because I may have to divulge some names. But I ended up going to church after that happened, which was a whole other story because they have noonday Bible study. At, was having noonday Bible study at my church. But um, they sent us home from work that day. It was officially a grieving day. Here was a day we were supposed to have this big company meeting to hear um, what was going on in the company and all of this. And they told everybody, go home, go home. So we had a paid day of work to go home and grieve, basically. And I remember how America was affected as a whole by something that happened to some people, not everybody, but I just felt like it moved everybody. And I feel like Kobe's death had that same type of effect to it. I feel like it was a like a silencing of sorts that came over people, like a, oh, ow, like a sucker punch. And uh, again, not that I'm a fan, but everybody felt it. And I believe that when people feel something like that, it's, it's what would be called like a necessary evil of sorts. Not that death is necessarily evil, but when you lose someone like that and the baby got to grow up, which she so, the baby is so young until you wonder if she'll even have memories of her daddy. Thank God he was a famous person. She'll get to see footage of him. Lots and lots of footage and, and basketball games and commercials and stuff of that nature, but she'll have vague memories of him because he died when she was so young. So it does leave a hole. However, I believe something good is going to come out of this and it's going to touch the lives of a lot of people. A lot of people are going to come together. A lot of people that have been holding grudges. Hear me. A lot of people who have not been speaking to one another, who think they got all the time in the world about to put aside petty differences and start back talking. It's amazing what a tragedy like that can bring about. For example, let's look at the whole um, Trayvon Smith thing. Tra not Trayvon Smith, Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin was the young man that went to the store to get a Sprite and some Skittles and a uh, neighborhood Robocop got after him and literally killed the poor baby. And he died, so her mom, his mom is without a son. This was a massacre. And then the guy got off. He didn't do the jail time that everybody felt he should do for killing this, this innocent child who was not a thug, who was not up to no good, nothing. And so, with that being said, Trayvon Martin, I believed, and I believe, and I, I made a Facebook post about this. You can go and find it. When they gave the verdict or were about to give the verdict, I said, I don't believe this man, I forgot his name, is going to do any time for killing this boy. And I believe that this is a necessary evil and that Trayvon Martin is going to be like a sacrificial lamb of sorts. He is going to be used to kick off a movement. And sure enough, from his death on up to the many others, uh, that I can't even name, but there's many of them. It kicked off what I would refer to as the neo or the new or the modern day civil rights movement. We had a civil rights movement that was going on in the 60s and the 70s. And now we have another one that started up after his death. People started taking to the streets. People started protesting all over again. Millennials who knew nothing about the hardships and black codes. Black codes were laws that were made up just for black people. After, after they released us from slavery, they came up with black codes. So a black code was, you could walk down the street, if you looked a white person in the eye, you could literally go to jail for that. If you were walking down a sidewalk and you didn't get off the sidewalk and let the white people pass, you could go to jail for that. Um, just so many laws and, and like Emmett Till lost his life, you know, whistling at a white woman. So there were black codes and then there was a lot of uh, terrorist act 
America, white America on black America, terrorist acts going on. And so we were in a time where people were speaking up and fighting back. And the same thing is going on now. The cops on the people, killing the people, most of them black, it's stuff being videotaped. And so they've taken to the streets. So I call it, I refer to it as the neo, uh, the neo civil rights movement. A lot of that was sparked from this one young man laying down his life along with a bag of Skittles and a Sprite. Sandra Bland, another good example of uh, the necessary evil. This woman was a professor. She was going down to Texas to teach college. She wasn't no thug. I still have my opinion about how she handled herself when he did pull her over. Because I was raised by a grandmother that taught me to be humble and to be afraid because I'm from the South. I'm from the dirty South. I'm in Louisiana. And, and, and so I get it. I know you got to be humble and put your white girl voice on it. Talk like this right here and change your tone so that you don't sound as threatening. I know how to do all of that. My mama taught me to code switch at an early age. So I would have code switched if I had been pulled over. I've gotten pulled over many times. Uh, I lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. I lived in Westland and in Canton when I lived in Metro Detroit. When I lived in Detroit, Michigan, I lived in Westland and Canton. And I used to bake cakes a lot. So randomly, I would be up in the middle of the night going to get flour and cake I and mean, sugar and cake ingredients in the middle of the night. And I, I got pulled over so many times, whether it was... I worked for the headquarters for Domino's and I also delivered pizza for them on the side too. I would get off from work real late, like one or two in the morning. I would always get pulled over. I was constantly getting pulled over. So I made sure I kept my insurance and my driving record straight. And when they came to the car, I had my license and registration out. And I was, I did my white girl voice and it worked out every time. They never gave me tickets. They never even really told me why they were stopping me. But at the time I had a wild Afro. So you would see all this nappy hair in the car in the middle of the night and I was getting stopped. But there's a way that you can get home safely if you play the game. And so I had my opinion about Sandra Bland. I felt she should have played the game a little bit better, but she was from up north. She didn't know to play the game. She wasn't raised uh, with that whole subservient thing uh, and that in that fear base. And I'm, I'm, I think it's, it's a lifesaver. But anyway, they took their girl to jail. She was killed. I believe she was killed in jail. And I believe this earth cries out now with the blood of Sandra Bland. But look what it's done. Look at the noise it's made. Look at the attention it's put on a prison system to where Sandra Bland ain't the first person they kill. I'm pretty sure, allegedly, I'm going to say that allegedly. But that jail that she was in, I guarantee you, she wasn't the first. She wasn't the first who mysteriously died in that jail. I bet you she wasn't. But when she laid down her life, a teacher got brought to a national attention she's now a netflix movie i believe or a lifetime movie but um people she is the name on t-shirts she is one of the names of this new neo civil rights movement so i believe there are necessary evils and i believe kobe and this whole death thing is a part of that so what i want to say in this video to wrap it all up I believe that we come here. I believe we plan our lives out with a team. Sometimes we come with a team so large and we also plan to leave with that same team. And I think that is the case in instances like that duck boat instance when all of those people died at one time. Um, I believe that that's what happened. I really do in my heart of hearts. Um, I believe that when we leave here, we either go to another life or I don't believe that's all. I mean, there's several things that can happen, but just to mention a couple of or a few of the things that can happen are that you get elevated to another place. Let's just say you live so many lives and then you come through this life. You come down to earth and you endure 
a lot of hardship, a lot of pain, and you get through it victoriously. Maybe you go on to write books. Maybe you're a teacher and you're changing lives, saving lives. Maybe you're a nurse. You're working hard, whatever. And then when you die, I believe you elevate to another realm. Like you may become a spirit guide, meaning let's just say if you're a spirit guide and you're a nurse, you also might be the person that comes in a room and talks to a nurse that's here on earth. So let's just say if there's an emergency going on as a spirit guide, you may come in and work with another nurse and tell her, check his, check this, check that, uh, do this, do that medical terms rather. But you know, you may talk somebody through how to do a tourniquet. You as a nurse, you may show up at the scene of a, of a horrible car accident, but as a, a nurse spirit guide, you're there to talk a total stranger through putting a tourniquet on and they don't know how they did it, but they saved a life at this accident and they're not a nurse. But this nurse practitioner came through because she was a nurse in another life, but she elevated the spirit guide. I think it's the same thing. I think you could also elevate into being an angel. Um, and we all know what angels do. It's, it's work. It's work. It's just work on the other side. Um, Definitely you go into the ancestor realm. So you may come back just to take care of your family, your ancestors and look out for them. Um, helping put their resume in front of people, helping their name to come up, whispering their name in somebody's ear in a business meeting and now their name is coming up. Uh, just all kind of stuff. Ancestors are around and um so that's that's what I believe in. I have some videos about ancestors and I'll make another video about this about some immediate grief, some, some processing and some things you can do immediately after a loved one dies. If you're having a hard time with the grieving or getting through, I do already have a video about this. Um, and it's about my cousin Nisi, who she definitely works on the other side. She left here at the age of 22. Nisi was every little black girl's dream. She was the light-skinned, pretty girl with this long, thick, woofy hair that was down her back. Cute, she could uh, run track. She was like, at one time in our elementary school, she was like the fastest girl in the school. And she was sweet as pie. And one day while she was playing um, in a basketball game, her uh, in junior high school, she was playing basketball and she fell out. And they, you know, took her away to the hospital and all of that, only to find that she had a tumor on her brain. Now, this was back in the in the 80s. This is like pre-85, pre-mid 80s. So there wasn't near as much cancer research out there as there is now. And so back in the day, I remember my grandparents were literally um, taking her. She had brain tumor. They cut off all of her beautiful hair. She ended up having to go bald and her hair never grew back that thick and that long after surgery. And now looking back on it, now that I'm in the medical field, I am a licensed massage therapist and I know a little bit about medical stuff. It seems like her personality changed after surgery. I remember her being very feisty, very... Um, she was always quiet and shy and, and somewhat withdrawn, but I remember her being real spicy. And then after the surgery, she had a totally, seemed like her personality was different. She was very, very, very meek, very mild, not as spicy, very quiet. And maybe that was the effects of all that she went through and how the family was handling it. Uh, because, you know, nobody even wanted to say the word cancer. Nobody wanted to talk about it, which is a whole nother video. But um, all that to say, I remember my grandparents would go with her all the way to Houston, Texas, because that was the place that people were going for cancer treatment and cancer research. They had the innovation there back in the 80s. And um, so that happened somewhere when she was maybe 12 years old. She first had the brain tumor. She had surgery or she may have been 14, 14, 12 or 14, somewhere in that area. And by the time she was 22, the cancer came back and it was like a downward spiral. She was in she was in college. She graduated high school, went to college, but never finished because it was always back and forth with bouts of sickness because of the cancer. And she ended up leaving here when she was 22. 
Now, I'm going to tell this part of the story. Thank you, God. I see why I'm going down this uh, lane to tell this story. Because this fits into my next point, my, one of my last points I wanted to make about releasing our loved ones. Sometimes it's time for our loved one to go on. People have gotten old. They've gotten uncomfortable. And we yet hold them here with our prayers. We're holding them here. And they're afraid to cross over. They're afraid to leave because we're praying them here. We're holding them here. We won't let go. That is a very selfish thing to do. If somebody is dealing with cancer like that, you got to know in your spirit what the purpose is for that person. And what I will tell you, what I will say now is get a reading. Get a reading from somebody. Get a skilled, reputable a reader, somebody that reads cards or throws those bones, whatever they do, get a reading from them about God's will for your loved one. Because chances are we are too close to the situation to be objective. Um, we're too close to the situation to let them go, especially us people of faith. We have been taught binding and loosing and praying in the name of Jesus. Uh, those of us who know the health, we're all about, you know, let's get some units of vitamin C in them. Let's get this. Let's get that. That has worked and it does work and it can work. However, there are times when you can try everything you want to try and a person still die because that was the soul pack. That's what they came here to do. It's their time. It's either their time or somewhere deep in their soul, they are ready to go. Hear me. These people that commit suicide, stop sending these folks to hell. Stop deciding. It was Sometimes folks be ready to go. And it ain't nothing we can do. We got to allow them to go and start over. Yes, grieve. Yes, cry. Yes, journal. Yes, go to therapy. Yes, some days you go close the curtains and stay in the bed in a fetal position. Do what you got to do, but at the end of the day, don't lose your life behind it. Don't let it alter your life in a negative way to where you can't go on. You're afraid to love again. Um, you're afraid to get close to anybody again because you lost one person. Sometimes that's the soul pact. That was the purpose that we decided when we came here. So when my cousin was sick, I was doing the play called Judgment Day. I don't know how many of y'all remember that from Shreveport. We did Judgment Day at the Strand Theater, sold out at the Strand Theater uh, for a whole weekend back in, I'm going to say that was 1990. No, okay, she died in 92, so that was 92. 91-ish, 90, 92-ish, somewhere around there. Yeah, something like that. But um, I was in college at Morris Brown. So it was past the 80s. And um, it was summertime. I came home. I did the play. And then I went on back to school. And as soon as I got back to school, she died like a week or two later. So we ended up burying her in like September 1992. Now, when I was at home doing the play that summer, I was a, a blood-washed, Bible-believing, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I was a all told and I still told all but you know put they put that all on there bind it up loose it call 30,000 prayer warriors get everybody to pray this cancer finna come up off of her that was my mentality and then I'll never forget we were in one of the rehearsals for judgment day and I told Tori's mom Tori play I played the devil in that play and Tori played Jesus this was a heaven and hell uh play Tori's mom used to come to all the all of the rehearsals and I told Tori's mom about my cousin uh, was in the hospital. I think she had you know, gone to the hospital or whatever. One of those bouts, again, in and out of the hospital with the cancer. And I said, I want to believe, I believe in God to heal her. And uh, we had agreed, you know, some sometime during rehearsal, we was going to get back there in the vestibule because the rehearsal used to be at this little small church in Motown. We was going to go back there in the vestibule and hold hands, join hands, touch and agree. We was going to pray. We was about to, well, her faith and my faith, one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. That's what the Bible say. We was about to, we was about to call on back in. And just as we got ready to pray, she paused. 
and she looked at me. So I'm sure spirit revealed to her that this this child wasn't going to make it and she was going to get up out of here. I wasn't ready to hear that. If she was 22, I was 20. It's my cousin. It's my first cousin. We grew up making Betty Crocker cakes together. I got pictures of us with our afros making Betty Crocker cakes. That's my cousin. She was like a sister. You know, she she can't die at no 22. Don't nobody die at 22. But sure enough, she said um, that the Holy Spirit was telling her to ask me if, if Nisi was saved and to make sure that I minister salvation to her and make sure she was saved. So here again goes that mentality of wondering if somebody's going to heaven or hell or saved or not before they get out of here. But all of that to say, that's not the subject of this conversation, but I don't agree with all of that anymore. But she did, she stopped before we touched and agreed about Nisi being healed from cancer. She had enough wisdom to know that this girl wasn't gonna make it and it was God's will to take her off this earth. So at 22, in September of 1992, Nisi passed. Now, because I'd had that prayer with Tori's mama at rehearsal, by the time she passed, it bothered me, it hurt. I cried, but there was a peace inside of myself because I knew, I already knew. I didn't want to know. And I was so young, and I was so young in my gifts back then until I wasn't about to say that out loud to nobody. And I was not about to be the one that was speaking her death either. All that kind of stuff. Power, life, and death is in the tongue. Well, we got to look at that script, scripture. The power of life and death is in the tongue. And sometimes it's time for somebody to die. So in that same vein, God has used me to release people too. Or people have told me about loved ones that have been extremely sick and they're nervous. And I'm like, do you want me to pray the prayer? And um, I haven't prayed it with them. But after they left, I prayed and those loved ones have gone on. I've had loved ones that I visited who were holding on by a thin thread uh, with cancer. And I prayed and I told them, you can leave now. And before morning, that loved one was gone. Um, things happen. Um, sometimes it's time and as a spiritual person you got to know the flow and the ebb of spirit as it's moving and when I say you got to know the flow and the ebb of, of spirit as it's moving it doesn't mean that there's a rule book to everything and how it's going to happen hear me here just because somebody gets a cancer diagnosis doesn't mean start working on the obituary and asking them what kind of casket they want. That don't mean that. Whether it's AIDS, whether it's uh, irritable bowel syndrome or whatever, a diagnosis don't necessarily mean that it has to stick with whatever the prognosis is. No. But you got to learn the flow and the ebb of the spirit, meaning there is no rule for how or which way God is going to move. But get in the spirit and find out if spirit how spirit wants you to pray if spirit wants you to pray miracle and turn around or if spirit wants you to pray release i feel an anointing right there i'm just gonna let that sit right there the blood bought believers are under the deception my god they're under the deception that we got power over everything. Because there is a scripture that says you got power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt you. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every time somebody gets sick, you get to pray it up off for them. You can pray it up off for them. But if that is not the plan for that particular soul then it's not going to happen. You can pray and sling all the oil you want to sling. And a lot of times when it comes to people getting elderly and on up in age, we are holding them here and their quality of life has left. Quality of life has left the building. And you keep holding them. You wrong for that. 
Stop doing that. Stop holding people here because it's your mama and you want your mama here. And I can speak from experience. Here's my second story. Nisi passed on in 1992. Nisi became my guardian angel of sorts after that. I constantly feel her all the time. I didn't know that that was what she was at the time. I didn't know that in 1992. But in 2013, my mother passed away in 2013. So in 2013, my mother passed away around the same time Nisi did, September 26th, I believe it was, September 26th, 2013 is when my mother passed. Okay, so I'm in a massage session at um, in Atlanta, the W Hotel. I'm working on this lady's feet, so I'm at the end of the session. I done sat down. I usually sit down when I'm working on feet. I got a blindfold over the ladies. You know, I usually put a little piece of a towel or something over the person's eyes so that they're not, um, they don't be sitting there with their eyes open. So anyway, I'm sitting there working on a feed, and then all of a sudden I felt Nisi come in the room. So you can listen to my other video where I go into detail and I tell the story. But Nisi told me that they were coming to get my mother. That was my first experience with her spirit. I didn't know. And I was scared. And I definitely wasn't about to tell nobody that. And there still was a part of me that was like, Okay, the blood of Jesus. You ain't supposed to know that about, okay, wait a minute. Okay, what now, what now, what? Okay, what, wait, what? So it was kind of, hmm. So that happened, I'm going to say that had to have happened around August-ish. Uh, because maybe July. I just remember it was hot when I went to work. And Nisa came to me a couple of more times, but I was remembering it vaguely because keep in mind, I had all of this um, church doctrine, one church that I went to in their new members class, they spent an extreme amount of time telling you not to communicate with spirit, not to communicate with any dead relatives that come back, all of that. And see, that is the devil because your ancestors are here for you. That's who's doing the work, which is a whole nother. I have to make a whole nother video about this because this is going into an hour. I'm going to stop this. But, um, anyway, when my mother died, they found my mother dead in the house. Um, they called it natural causes. My mother was prone to having uh, seizures. They had no cause for the seizures, which is a whole nother video I could tell you about, but I ain't gonna tell her. But she was having, she, I don't, we don't know if she had a seizure or not. They just found her dead in a pool of blood. It was not homicide. It was not anything of that nature. So uh, when I came home, my mother and I were estranged, which is a whole nother video. But I still love my mother. You know, at some point you have to stay away from people if they're not, uh, if it's unhealthy for you. I'll put it to you that way. So I was still grieving, though. Grieve my mother. And when we were at the burial for my mother, um, I felt this amazing sense of peace. Amazing. And I remember I took out some gum and started chewing some gum. Because I was trying to keep from doing this. I felt like doing this. Because as we were sitting there in front of the casket, you know how you get under the little tent. It's kind of dim under there. And people are getting out of their cars because the family gets there first. People are getting out of their cars, gathering around for the funeral. Everybody getting in their place and different ones crying and whatnot. I had already had my cry in the, uh, you know, at the funeral and stuff. But as I was... Sitting there in the chair, a flock of birds flew by. I could see them across the field, across the cemetery. They flew by, and I felt, my God, I felt the release. I felt her. I felt, I felt the freedom. I felt the rightness of this situation. I felt the rightness of September 26, 2013. And I smiled. And I was like, and I was like, okay, let me chew some gum. Because we were estranged, I already knew that people had an opinion about me, a negative one. And they probably thought I was sitting there out of spite, smiling over my mama's grave. And that was not the case. The case was, I knew in my spirit, 
Here again, we're talking about the flow and the ebb of the spirit. Know the flow of the spirit. If you don't do nothing else before you get off this earth, find the flow of the spirit. Because what spirit is doing for me right now, not being a hardcore Bible believer anymore, not being a member of anybody's church and all of that, this is the flow of the spirit. It breaks tradition. It breaks doctrine. It breaks everything you know. But it's a flow. And there's a peace. I don't lose sleep at night. Because when I lie down to sleep, my sleep is sweet. Try the spirit by the spirit. So behold, God has given to me power over all the power of enemy and nothing by any means shall hurt thee. So ain't nothing coming through my ancestor altar that me and I won't be able to handle. Me and Jesus. Because I still use the name of Jesus when I fight. Which is a whole nother story. Man got after me. Ooh, this man, this crazy man got after me when I was driving ride shed the other night. It's a whole nother story. But I was blood of Jesus Jesus and down. But anyway, that's my video for today. I'm going to wrap it up. We've got to change our mindset about death, people. I know this Kobe Bryant thing is shocking. But we've got to change our mindset of, oh, that's awful. It's, oh, my God. Oh. Now I'm going to go have a stroke because my mama just died. No. We've got to release it. We've got to release it. God know what he's doing and these people know what they're doing too. People slipping up out of here when they're good and ready. Let these older loved ones go. Stop praying and holding them here. And be at peace in your spirit about this whole Kobe Bryant thing. Be at peace with it. Be at peace. I say all of this respectfully. I say all of this um, with love and consideration for people who knew him, close friends that are grieving. And I pray, it's my prayer in making this video that this has been a thing of comfort for you and not aggravation. So maybe if it's not making sense to you now, come back and listen to it again and let it sink in. But I lost my mother. And I knew, matter of fact, I'm going to say this. The day that she died, September 26, I got up to get ready for work. And around that time, I believe, is when she fell at the house in Shreveport. I was in Atlanta. When I awakened that day, getting ready to go to work, I used to get up around noonish. ish um, I felt Nisi. I felt her presence very strong. I could not remember what we had discussed, but I knew she had communed with, she had communicated with me. Uh, in the sleep realm or that whatever that realm is you go into between awake and asleep and um, I was thinking about my mom and so I called my cousin Bridget and you'll hear more on the other tape but long story short by the time I got to work me and Bridget talked for a couple of hours and when I got to work we talked some more I got off the phone and in the middle of my massage my phone started going off in the dark and I knew in my spirit, again, knowing the flow and the ebb of the spirit, I knew in my spirit, she's gone. She's gone. That girl came to me in that dream again that day. Now, she came to me in that massage room, but she came back two more times. And the last one was the day that she passed. I felt it in my spirit. So, therefore, I was able to finish a complete shift at work that night. I was the only therapist there. And we were booked. I had booked clients all night. That night I, I finished that shift and I was pretty numb when it happened. But what I will say is there was a peace. And again, when I sat there at that grave site and those birds, be I remember they were flying from left to right. They were going like over to the right. Uh, I don't know if that was east or west or north or south, whichever way they were flying. But I felt a smile came upon my face and I started chewing. I put a piece of gum in my mouth and started chewing it so that I, it wouldn't look like I was sitting there laughing. But there was a peace there, and I thank God for that. So this has been my video about death. I will make another one talking about um, that grieving process. And um, thank you for tuning in. Please hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, share this video. I am Yariel. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Be well.